very well. Um, I see that most of you are students. How many of us are science students over here? Can I get a raise of hands, please? Okay, quite a bit. So this talk is primarily guided for you. And I hope you enjoy it. And I hope the rest of us can enjoy it as well. So before I start um, this talk, I would just like to uh, start with a confession that I'm not much of a public speaker. So the first thing I did to prepare for this talk was Google tips for TED speakers. <laughs> so the main tip I got was that I needed to tell a story to engage the audience. You see, human beings are wired to like stories. And physicists are human beings too, I'd like to say. We enjoy stories as well. In fact, uh, one could argue that we are the biggest fans of stories. The difference is that we don't tell or write stories, we discover them. Since uh, millennia, physicists have been trying to uncover the longest story that there ever will be. The story of our universe, of our creation, of this marvelous cosmos we are living. Our universe is the oldest thing that we know of. It's 13.82 billion years old. Since its inception from a big explosion some 14 billion years ago, it has come a long way. And we have been trying to figure out what happened since then. And actually we have figured out quite a bit. And I would like to quickly run you through a brief history of our universe, if you let me. So here's a timeline of our universe as created by the European Space Agency. I'm not sure how many of you can see with my slides, but observations show us that our universe was created from one big explosion called the Big Bang. One second after that, um, tiny subatomic particles like quarks and uh, electrons had been produced in the first second. And our universe was extremely tiny, dense, and extremely hot. Our early universe was very simple, just a sea of quarks and electrons, because it was way too hot for the subatomic particles to stick together and form atoms. In the next three minutes, or somewhere over here, um, the temperature was right for fusion to occur, and the electrons um, and protons were formed by fusion of uh, quarks. And in the next 17 minutes, the protons, neutrons, and electrons came together to form the very first atoms. At the end of the 20 minutes mark, uh, the, the universe had expanded and cooled enough that fusion was impossible now. And uh, at this point, we had about 75% hydrogen, 25% helium, and just a little bit of lithium. Now let's jump ahead to when our universe was 308,000 years old. Our universe entered a very special phase called the recombination. What happened here was our universe had expanded. It was big enough that light particles could fly through the universe. And this is the first light of the universe that we see, the very first light. We cannot see before this point. This first light of the universe is known as the cosmic microwave background. We still see it today. What we see is that this first light of our universe is extremely uniform all throughout the universe, which tells us that our early universe was extremely uniform and very simple. Since then, our universe continued to expand, and dark matter and ordinary matter particles compressed, condensed together due to gravity, and started forming structures, eventually forming stars where all the elements of life were cooked. So technically everything today, everything, myself, this clicker, this room, everything can be derived from the initial laws of physics and a few hydrogen atoms. Scientists have long been trying to prepare, to build a model to describe and connect everything in our universe, from the teeniest particles of the Big Bang to the largest structures today and everything else. The model that we have now is called the standard model, which explains all matter particles 
as uh, in terms of elementary particles. This is what the standard model has predicted and found so far. The standard model predicts these 12 matter particles. They come in two different types called the quarks and the leptons. The quarks make up the protons and neutrons in the atomic nuclei and you see the electron there, it's the thing that goes around the atomic nuclei as many of you might know. Um, many of you actually probably um, don't know that even protons and neutrons are made of quarks, even tinier particles. We only study up to electron, proton, and neutron. So I just want to introduce the concept of quarks. So all these 12 matter particles were predicted by this standard model much before they were discovered, and now they have all been discovered. The standard model also explains the forces of nature. There are four fundamental forces in nature, gravity, electromagnetism, strong and weak interactions. Gravity is the weakest force of all. I can beat it just by jumping a bit. You see, I need gravity. Electromagnetism, on the other hand, is much stronger. It is responsible for keeping the electron bounded to the atomic nuclei, and it's responsible for all of the chemistry that we see. It is much stronger than gravity, which is why I cannot simply pull an electron from this uh, paper like I could beat gravity by jumping a bit. The weak interaction is responsible for radioactivity and also plays a role in how our sun burns. And the strong interaction is what keeps our quarks bounded together inside the protons and neutrons and also the atomic nuclei bounded together. The standard model explains these four forces of nature as exchange of force carrier particles, which are right over here. Photon, this one, is responsible for carrying electromagnetic force. The gluons carry the strong force, and the W and the Z bosons carry the weak force. The corresponding force carrier particle for gravity, which is called the graviton, has not yet been discovered. So the standard model is missing to include gravity in its frame. But the rest of all of these particles predicted by standard model have been discovered. But there was one huge missing link in, in completing our standard model. Can anyone guess what that could be? It's right on the slide. It's this big fat particle right in the middle. Okay. It's called a Higgs boson, which is very essential for the standard model to stand on its own. This is the particle that's supposed to give mass to all the other particles. One wonders, how is there mass in this universe? Why am I heavy? Why are electrons uh, heavy? And standard model explains that Higgs boson is the reason to give mass to all the other particles. We have been looking for this particle for decades. And it was predicted in the 60s, if I'm correct. And we have not discovered this particle. So how does one go about finding this really important particle? You see, the Higgs boson is really massive. It's equivalent to about 133 protons. It's very heavy. And as many of you science students here might know, from the Einstein's famous equation, E is equal to mc squared. What does that mean? It means mass is energy. This particle is really massive, which means to find this particle, we have to go to really high energy scales. We have to go to the energy scales present during the Big Bang, during the creation of the, our universe, when a huge amount of energy was released. We have to go to such conditions. And as discussed earlier, we cannot see the light past the recombination point. We cannot see the light with our telescopes or any instrument. So this gives us a reason to create mini Big Bangs in our labs. This is CERN, located across the border of France and Switzerland. This is home to the Large Hadron Collider, this 27 kilometer long tunnel that is underground, 100 meters underground. And the Large Hadron Collider is the biggest machine ever built for science experiments. 
The Large Hadron Collider is a 27 kilometer long tunnel where protons are accelerated over 99% of the speed of light, which is the fastest we can go. We do this using electric fields which accelerate these protons and magnets all around this tunnel uh, bend these accelerated beams of protons into circular uh, tunnels. When these accelerated protons reach their maximum velocity, they are collided together inside huge detectors to create the conditions present during the Big Bang. See, this is the proton going through it, and it comes, and there is another one coming from the other direction. They both collide right in the center of a huge detector, and we get a, an explosion similar to what our early universe would have looked like. And this machine catches whatever comes out of it. That's what we hope for. At these high energy scales, maybe we find some new particles, and maybe we find the Higgs boson that we have been looking for for a long time. This is the Atlas detector. It's one of the biggest detectors of the LSE, the main ones, and also the one I worked on. You can see the huge scale of it, and here's a little selfie I took when I was there, also to show you what it looks like in real life and the grand scale of it. In 2012, the Atlas detector and CMS, another experiment at CERN, announced the discovery announced the discovery of the Higgs boson on 4th of July, coincidentally also my birthday. So in 2012, we found this missing particle that we had been looking for a long time. It was a huge deal for particle physicists and all of physics and a completion of the standard model, which we had been looking for. I was still in college back then at the University of Chicago, and I still remember my professor got a phone call right in the middle of a lecture and uh, he just stormed out of the classroom without any announcement. The announcement came a bit later with the discovery of the Higgs boson. It was all over the news, and not just that, it also led to the Nobel Prize in Physics of the year. This was a huge deal. With the, with the discovery of Higgs boson, the standard model was now complete. But was the physics complete? The physics was far from over. We still had many unanswered questions. Like how do we fit gravity into our model of the universe? What is dark energy? Why is our universe expanding? What is dark matter? The questions are endless. With our spirits raised from the discovery of the Higgs boson, we started to work together to shoot the machine again at double the energy. Higher energy means getting closer to the Big Bang, getting closer to newer physics and newer particles. Maybe we discover something completely new, some theory even better than the standard model, who knows. I flew to Geneva a week after my graduation from my university and I started working on the Atlas experiment. I worked on calibrating the tile calorimeter detector. This is the Atlas experiment. These are the tile calorimeters. I, along with several hundred other scientists and engineers, were working hard to make sure, to ensure that everything was ready and everything was working good before we run the machine again and started colliding protons at double the energy. On July 3rd, 2015, we successfully restarted the machine at double the energy this was us uh, popping champagne bottles in the control room when we had succeeded after a couple of years of uh, consolidation. And this is a picture from my camera of not so good quality uh, of how the control lo room looked, you know, during the second, when the second run started. And since then, uh, I ended my job at CERN um, a few weeks after that, my job there was done, and I went on to do other things. Um, since then, uh, the LNC has been taking data uh, for the next two years, and actually, 
the data taking just ended three weeks ago. And uh, we are hoping that uh, uh, in the next two years when scientists will continue to analyze the huge amount of data collected over uh, this second run, uh, we will find some new discoveries, some new physics. Already we have published, uh, Atlas has published over 200 papers and two more production mechanisms for Higgs boson have been discovered. This was a great year, 2018 was a great year for CERN, for LHC, with the highest data taking uh, efficiency. So, we have uncovered some amazing things about our universe in our quest to understand this place we all share. But, our understanding is far from complete. The standard model does a wonderful job at explaining most of our universe's history of this story, but we still have many questions. As I said earlier, we still don't know how to reconcile quantum mechanics and gravity together in one theory. And uh, uh, we don't understand the nature of dark energy and dark matter. Why are there two types of matter particles, quarks and leptons, and why are there 12 of them? Why is the Higgs boson so much more massive than the other particles? We have lots of questions. We hope that the experiments at the LHC and the results from that will shed new light into the dark mysteries of our universe. In conclusion, I would like to say that our universe is uh, an elusive beauty, giving us more of the reasons to keep pursuing it. And I'm hopeful that our efforts and curiosities will lead us to um, understand even better what our universe is like. And maybe, perhaps someday, we can tell the entire story of our universe to our kids during bedtime. And lastly, I just want to say that living in Birgans these days, it's very easy for us to get lost in the debates about identity, racism, and politics. But I encourage you all not to forget the larger world that we all share, which is very, very interesting. So when you go out today from this room, I encourage you to go and learn more about this place, this beautiful place. And as this picture should remind you, this is a picture of the planet Earth. I don't think you can even see it. It's somewhere over there. It shows us that our planet is just a flicker of dust hanging in the space, as Carl Sagan called it, just a pale blue dot in this space, and tells us how fragile it is. So I would just like to end with saying that stay curious and remember to the universe we are all the same. Thank you. <laughs>